Our guest is Paul Dwarren, who is the author of the Mike Bowditch series of crime novels and an Edgar Award-nominated author. Paul and his, now his fifth book, The Bone Orchard. Currently on tour, Paul is uh, editor emeritus of Down East, the magazine of Maine, having served as editor-in-chief uh, from 2005 to 2013. Wow. And then he stepped down to do this right full time. And wow, what a master he is at that. He's also a registered Maine guide, and, and he's uh, specialized in fly fishing. And he lives on a trout stream in coastal Maine with the eagles looking down on him, watching him do his work. Paul, that must be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is awesome, Phil, although it, more often it's vultures looking down <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I try not to take that as an omen, you know. Oh, that is too funny. <laughs> well, welcome to the land of the Wampanoag, historic New Bedford. Nice to have you with us here. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. And in fact, I just finished the book Mayflower, so I've been thinking a lot about your part of the world. Wow. Well, we're going to have to have you back. Mayflower, huh? That is mm -hmm. terrific. We'll definitely have you back for that. But, but before I actually we, we jump into uh, this great new... And I want to ask you in a minute, you know, what is it? A novel, a thriller, a mystery? You know, um, what is it like, Paul, to be an outdoors guide? Well, it's... Uh in many ways, it's a it's a dream job, but it's also a service job in the sense that you you know you you get to be outdoors and and do things that people pay money to uh, to do for their vacations. You know whether it's fishing or hunting or canoeing or whatever it is. But of course, you know why while your responsibility there is to is to make sure that they're safe and having a you know a good experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I, I'm friends with with a lot of professional guides. You know who've been doing this their whole lives, and and they'll have, uh, you know, take a Fortune 500 fishing, uh, Fortune 500 executive fishing, and the, you know, this is a guy who's a CEO of a big company, and he'll he'll look across the canoe at my friend and say, oh man, you just have the best job in the world. <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, that's the direction I was heading in. You open up brand new worlds for people, which I think is a huge public service. You also do this, now segueing into your, is it a novel, a thriller, a mystery, with, with your fabulous series. You do the same thing. Thank you. I, um, yeah, it's a series of crime novels. Um, you know, there's a mystery in them, and they're also pretty thrilling, I think. Um, and they're about a main game warden named Mike Bowditch. Uh, so they're set in the main woods and take place all over the state of Maine, which gives me a chance to poke around in some different locations from book yep. to book. Yeah. And now this is your fifth, right? That's right. And uh, I want to start with the title, Bone Orchard. Thrilling. Mm -hmm. That's very, very interesting. Why the title? It's actually an old expression. You don't hear it around a lot anymore uh, for a graveyard. In the book, though, it's um, it's kind of a, a joke in the sense that there's an actual family graveyard, as you often find in New England, these little, you know, patches of tombstones in the middle of nowhere, uh, in an apple orchard um, near one of the characters' houses, and something pretty bad happens there. So it it has a, a bit of a double meaning for the for the book. Wow, you only meant hmm? you, you only mention it uh, briefly in the beginning of the book. So you know, I was just wondering if it had a double meaning, a deeper meaning, uh, any significance for your characters. Well, I, my, my previous book had been called uh, Massacre Pond, um, which is a real place actually in the town I grew up, uh, Scarborough, Maine, and I liked the way that it combined both 
something a little ominous in uh, bone yeah. and something natural in terms of orchard. So that right. seems to be the way that my, my books are being, <laughs> are getting their titles, you know. It's, it, it, uh, but if, you know, if it, if it intrigues somebody and causes them to pick it up off the, the shelf on the bookstore, you know, all the better. Yeah, yeah, give us, uh, you, you do the unfolding of the storyline here for us. Sure. Uh, my main character, Mike Bowditch, is a, a young main game warden uh, in the previous books, and he's sort of characterized by being pretty reckless and headstrong, and he gets himself into trouble constantly with his superiors who tell him, you know, he's not really fit to be a warden and, and are trying to drive him out of the service. At the start of the Bone Orchard, they've actually done so. Mike has quit, and he's now working as a fishing guide. But he's already beginning to regret the decision. You know, he, he, he really enjoyed a lot of the parts of being a warden, and uh, which in Maine are, are essentially full-fledged cops. Um, sure. They happen to work in the woods. Yep, yep. Um, anyway, one of his good friends, his former sergeant, is a woman named Kathy Frost. And early in the book, Kathy is called to the house of a uh, uh, a wounded veteran of the Afghanistan war who has been badly disfigured during the war, and he's, he's suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome and, uh, you know, is, is on some pretty heavy-duty drugs, and he's been drinking all day, and he's threatening to kill himself. Mm. And what happens, unfortunately, is that he provokes... Kathy and another warden into killing him. Um, it's a he raises a shotgun and they're forced to shoot him. It's a phenomenon that takes place um, in the real world, uh, regrettably called uh, suicide by cop. Oh yes, oh yeah, that is tragic. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and you know, and, and there's a real crisis going on too right now among our veterans right. who are. Um, uh, attempting suicide, contemplating suicide. It's really something that needs to be addressed on a society level. And it's one reason I wanted to put it in the book was just to call attention to it. But in the in the story, you know, it, it, it le- one thing leads to another. And um, Kathy is, is suspended uh, because police shootings are always followed by an investigation. And many of the soldiers... Um, uh, friends from his unit think the shooting was unjustified. Kathy begins to get anonymous threats, and eventually she herself is attacked. And, and my character, Mike Bowditch, you know, despite now being a civilian, finds himself sucked into this investigation to discover who was the person who who shot her. And so she's on death's door, and and he's desperately trying to figure out who the mysterious person was who who attacked his friend. Mm-hmm. We are chatting with somebody I know you're going to love his work, Paul Dwarn. His latest, The Bone Orchard, is now available. And this is a Minotaur book publication, right? Right. Minotaur is a, it's a division of St. Martin's Press. Gotcha. And... Uh, is it necessary for us to go back and kind of read your other novels to get a better grasp of, you know, what's happening in The Bone Orchard? I don't think so. I think The Bone Orchard you can read um, without having read the other ones. Uh, the first book in the series is called The Poacher's Son, and, and it won some awards, and I was very fortunate that that was the case. Um, you know, I think there's you can gain something from reading the book, the books um, from one to the next sure. because my character does grow up quite a lot, and this book is a crucial turning point in his life. Um, but with each novel, I try to write it in such a way that you know, if it's the first time you've ever heard of me, and you just happen to be you know at your local library or bookstore, and this thing intrigues you, you can pick it up and read it without having to to have a whole lot of backstory. You can. Yep. Decide then if you want to go back and and you know start at the beginning. If uh, if we wanted to start with the inside 
of your main character, Mike, Mike mm-hmm. Bodich. Is he flawed? Is he a great guy? Is he somebody you want to sit down and have a beer with? Who, who is he really inside? Who is he really? He, well, he's a flawed guy. Um, he, uh, his father in the first book, the, the poacher of the poacher's son, is this sort of notorious Northwoods uh, poacher, sort of logger, um, petty criminal. He's a bar brawler and, you know, a woman's man. And and uh, um, and Mike is estranged from him, so it creates a real problem. Mike, this, in fact, decides to become a law enforcement officer as a challenge to his father to make his father respect him. And, and uh, you know, his father thinks this is sort of a ridiculous turn of events and doesn't work out the way that Mike had hoped. So he's, Mike's really struggling. You know, he feels he, he's sort of caught between a couple of different worlds. And, and it's one of the reasons why he's had trouble in the warden service is that uh, he, he has his own personal demons that he's dealing with. And, you know, and uh, on the other hand, he's also very big hearted and he's certainly, certainly brave and, and intelligent enough to to solve a lot of crimes that uh, the state police yeah. are unable to do in my books. Sure. Um, I saw a favorable uh, editorial about some, one of your readers, actually, wrote something to the effect that you don't try to make these uh, characters of yours uh, epic motion picture figures. Instead, your characters have a sense of smell. I thought that was one of the highest <laughs> compliments because you pay detail. Obviously, you're, you're paying detail to not only the character and the description, but also to the surroundings of this character. Well, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to make him a, a main game warden. You know, game wardens spend their entire lives pretty much outdoors. Um, yeah. And when you are outdoors and your job is to is to find people, you know, whether they're lost hikers or, or poachers who don't want to be caught, um, mm-hmm. you know, you have to use all of your senses. And you, you notice things um, the way that, uh, you know, you, you, I mean, the smell of somebody's aftershave, I suppose, you could follow through the woods and uh, or their bug repellent, say. Um, and, you know, everything comes into play, I think, out, when you're out, outdoors and you're, you're sort of just very still and you're listening and you're looking closely at the bent grass that somebody has left behind as they've gone through a field or... Sure. You know, it's it, it was a way for me to really immerse myself in in the Maine woods, and uh, you know, it's just my favorite place in the world, and I I really wanted to to bring it to readers, yes, uh, who've never been here. Well, th- that's another thing that I I think you ought to be embraced for, and that is, by the way, folks, Paul Dwarren, our special guest, whose latest novel, The Bone Orchard, is a must read up for your summer reading list. It is, it is uh, filled with all the sights and smells and sounds of a state that so many people either don't pay attention to, have underestimated, or need to really look at Maine as one of the most gorgeous states in all of our country. I fully agree. <laughs> Your writing style embraces that. I mean, you, you ta- there is, there truly is a love for what Maine is all about. Uh, do you find yourself and your protagonist uh, going in and out of uh, each other's mindset? <laughs> <laughs> you keep one world, yeah. one foot in this world, another one in the world of fiction? <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it's pretty, it, it can be difficult, I will admit. I, I have to remind myself on occasion that I'm, that I'm not Mike Bowditch. Um, uh, He's certainly uh, he's certainly younger and better looking than me, so I you know I don't want to get carried away here. Is he narrating the stories? Yes, you hear everything from Mike's point of view. So um, 
which I think is one of the things that that is fun about the series is that you know he is getting he's maturing from book to book, and you can if you follow it, you know you'll you feel pretty close to him. I, I have readers who who get frankly frustrated when Mike makes mistakes because mm-hmm. they say, "Oh, you're you know you dummy, how did you you should have known better than to get involved with that woman or whatever it is." But right. I think that actually that's pretty frustrating. I mean, for, pretty flattering that they're so frustrated because, sure. um, <clears throat> you know, it means that they care about the character and, uh, you know, they're not bored by him. In fact, they're really engaged by him. Right, exactly. And what would you say moves uh, the story along with, with, you know, suspense and with uh, the kind of uh, page-turning energy that one needs in order to make it a great novel? Well, that's a good question. I think, you know, I'm very careful when I'm setting out to create a story to find something that uh, has a hook to it that, you know, is going to really sustain your interest for the length of a novel, you know. And in The Bone Orchard, it's this, you know, it's this drive to find, for Mike to find the person who shot his friend. And, uh, at the same time, you know, it's it's not just a formula book. I mean, I, you can read it quickly, and I have readers who do read it very fast um, and, you know, email me saying, when's the next one coming out? <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I try to make each character unique and feel real and, uh, and, and then, you know, write as well as I can so that the language itself is pleasurable to read. So it's, I think it all goes, in, it, you know, together to, to create books that, um, you know, people tell me are are rewarding and that they're looking forward to, you know, to the next one. I want to uh, couple the thought of what we were discussing earlier in the talk show. I had a a listener phone in, Paul, who uh, told me in no, uh, in, 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 uh, he said he was illiterate. He couldn't read. Mm. And uh, we talked about that for a while, and I want to segue into how did you choose writing as a profession? When Do you remember the first time a, a word jumped off the page and then embraced Paul Dwarren and said, oh, this is... <laughs> <laughs> this well, is I it. Com- <laughs> I was a pretty compulsive reader as a as a little kid, okay. and um, okay. and I do remember actually the, the 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 moment that I wanted to become a writer, which was actually after I started reading uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit. Ah. Just I I really loved that story, and I thought, oh, it would be so fun to tell a story of my own, and mm. um, you know have have been very fortunate to be able to pursue my life's dream, you know, and now I'm doing it full time, but, yes. but I, I agree with your caller, you know, I mean, illiter- illiteracy is a, is a real problem. I'm, um, uh, and it's a hidden problem in our culture, I think too. You mm-hmm. know, I, I'm a member of the uh, Maine Humanities Council up here and, and literacy is one of the areas that we focus on. I think it's a really important service to, wow. uh, to educate especially adults who have been, you know, who've been ashamed and left behind throughout their lives to make sure that they feel like they can, you know, not be embarrassed to admit this and and start, you know, learning to read because it's such a joy and uh, and such a great way, too, to better your life in in so many different ways. You know, this reminds me of something that my sister did with her uh, then-husband, Oh, I'm going back 30 years ago, Paul, in Bangor. They started a, um, a, a, a conservatory of music. And and she would say, you know, Phil, uh, the, uh, the farmers are bringing in their kids, and we have kids coming in from outside the area, and we're teaching them. Uh, not only how to play, but how to read, and, and, and it's an enriching process here. So I understand where you're at when you, when you talk about touching and really helping mold the human being. And uh, she, for, for years, they had the Conservatory of, uh, of Music up in Bangor that did just that with music. Well, it really is important to get kids at an age when, you know, when they're still... 
open to you know to learning new things i'm i'm often um invited into high school classrooms by english teachers who say to me you know i have some boys in these cl- in my class who who just won't read they just don't think it's important uh, in their lives and right uh, but then i but then they'll tell me you know i i gave them you know your book the poacher's son and they they just tore through it because it was you know, it was about all the things that they like to do in their life, yeah. you know, hunting and fishing and riding an ATV. And, <laughs> and he said, they said, you know, you've, you've really, you know, it opened a window for them, you know, where they've realized that there are things, there are books that they enjoy. You know, there are people who are writing about subjects that are, that are close to their hearts. And I think then that becomes the way to, to get them to read other things. So I'm, yes. you know, I'm thrilled that that's, that that's taking place. We're with Paul Dwarn, who's the author of the uh, Mike Bowditch series of crime novels, also an Edgar Award-nominated author who uh, is... You're already finished with Mayflower, so needless to... No, no, to, no. <laughs> huh? I, 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 was, I was saying that I was reading the book Mayflower. Oh, you were I'm, reading I'm sorry it. That I, I'm sorry. I, 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 <laughs> I want to know when the book is coming out. <laughs> well, although I will tell you that, that it, was such a, it was such a compelling mm. book, it made me think that I'd love to write a historical novel about the... Uh, well, the early the early uh, Indian wars against the uh, the English and settlers. It's, yeah, uh, it, it, it actually might be right down my alley. In fact, well, let me ask you about the the genre and and uh, why you chose uh, you know the, the genre genre you write in, Paul. Why, why is this? Well, I'm, I've always been a, a fan of crime novels uh, or, or mystery stories. You know, from the early Sherlock Holmes books that I was reading as a kid and Agatha Christie and that sort of thing. I, um, I like to tell a good story, yeah. you know, and I like to read a good story too. I think yes. that's the thing. I, you know, I, um, I, I certainly, uh, appreciate, uh, great literature and, uh, you know, I, I try to write as well as I can write, but on the other hand, I, I think there's a lot to be said for, for just, you know, finding a book that, entertains you and uh, you know and makes you want to keep turning pages and right and, you know and and, and it, it's exciting and and you know it can be also uh powerful it can leave you, you mm-hmm. know, some, of, some of these books that i think we sort of think of as being uh oh you know beach books or whatever can have a lot of staying power in your life uh You'd be sometimes you're always surprised, you know, about the books that you were, you know, you have fond memories of, and you know, I, I try to write books that that people want to read. Right. Certainly, they're books that I want to read, and that helps motivate me. Well, while these uh, vultures are looking down, have you ever experienced <laughs> writer's block, or <laughs> have oh, you? Ever, yes. Have you? <laughs> yeah, you know, but I think <laughs> when I was an editor, I I had a theory about writer's block when my when my writers would come to me and say, "Oh, I can't finish this article." <laughs> I, I would tell them that, you know, usually what it is is that you just don't have enough information. You, then you, you need to go out and do more uh, interviews. Ah, you know, fascinating. It, you're you know, you're not usually blocked if you know about something intimately. Uh, you can. It's pretty easy to write if you're if you're writing from a a place of of knowledge and uh, and so you know I, I'm a, alert to that in my own mm-hmm. process. If I if I ever feel stalled on a on a problem, it's, I say to myself, you know, I think there's probably something here that I need to go stop and and go do a little more research. Very interesting. About how long did it take you to write the latest Bone Orchard? Uh, about a year. Yeah. Wow. See that? Yeah. I, I have a my my contract is is that I write a book a year. Okay. Um, and of course, it's a lot easier now that I'm doing it full time. Sure. Sure. Um, we mentioned Mayflower. Are you working? What project are you working on now? Anything in the future? <laughs> <laughs> I'm writing actually the the sixth Mike Bowditch book. Great. Great. Um, and uh, and in fact, I was listening to the book Mayflower while I've been on my book tour, which actually had taken me um, down your way. I was in Needham, Massachusetts, and Cambridge, and uh, and then flew out of Logan down to North Carolina. Oh wow! Tomorrow I'm in Bar Harbor, Maine. So I'm I'm ranging far and wide on this. Yep. On this trip. 
Are you hearing from uh, readers, from fans? Are they uh, coming up to you and saying, Paul, uh, this is what I love about your your characters, or I can smell the wild berries. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I get I get a lot of fan mail. Um, yeah. It was one of the things that took me by surprise when I first published my my very first novel. Um, and you know, there's just really nothing better. I, I really enjoy uh, hearing from people who who were moved by the books, who enjoyed the books, and. You know, and, and going out and doing readings and book signings and having people come up to me, um, you know, with a stack of my five novels and saying, yeah. can you sign all of these? It, it, it is really, it's really a great experience. And, wow. That, is, yeah. that, that, is, that would be fabulous. You know, we, we had the former First Lady uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton not too far from here in Seekonk over the weekend, and they were lining up since uh, midnight to get her autograph on her book. But you know what? <laughs> it's, it, it is, I think, a greater compliment for somebody to walk in with five, five of your books and say, please, you know, this is uh, a, a, pr- a pleasure if you would autograph these. I mean, this is what I think, you know, uh, when you, when you uh, read a book, you want to have, as you pointed out, Paul, you know, that love of reading and the love of story and adventure and uh, all, all the things that uh, make a good story uh, come out. Um, as, as we uh, head towards home here, do you give out any advice to um, uh, aspiring writers, or are you learning from this character yourself? I definitely am, and I learn about writing every time I, I start a new book. I mean, it, it's like any other skill in yeah. life, that the more that you do it, the, you know, the better you become. And I'm also, a, you know, place a lot of... Um, trust in my editor who is who's been great for me and and you know has been helpful in making my my work better but the the um the piece of advice that i always give to anybody who wants to um to write especially writing a novel is that you just really need to to persevere you know you need to um i think people start a lot of novels and and most of them you know give it up Somewhere along the way, but uh, but the, you know the the secret to su- success, I think, is is finishing. You know, seeing everything through. I mean, I, I take a the, the the Bill Belichick approach. You know, you play all sixty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any tips on fly fishing? <laughs> what? How yes. can I get the best action in my rod? <laughs> it's not about strength. Oh, don't it's try not... to over, Don't try to over-muscle your cast. It's all about line speed. It's a, uh-huh. it's a very fluid motion. <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, I used to unscramble eggs, but uh, I don't know about unscrambling the fly line. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the other piece of it. You have to be comfortable with knots. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I can't tell you what a pleasure. It has been wonderful having you on. And with future projects, we want you to make this uh, a regular stop on your tour. And uh, keep us up to date with uh, Mike Bodich and, of course, all that you're doing, Paul. Well, thanks, Phil. This has really been a pleasure on my end, too. Uh, Thank you so much. I, I, I love to end by asking this question. When you step aside and back from who you are in life, what you've done, all your experiences, whether uh, they were with the 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 paper or, you know, the magazine uh, down east, the magazine of Maine, or or the books, the novels, whatnot. What has all of this taught you about life itself? It's taught me that connection with other people is a very difficult but necessary um, goal to be pursuing each day you know we I think as human beings we you know we we can feel pretty isolated um, and yeah. by writing you you find a way to 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 
get close to somebody else. You know, you sort of get into somebody else's skin when you read a book, and mm-hmm. and it's it, it's it's a way to under for us to understand each other uh, better. And I, I just, you know, I'm always happy that that the the work I've done over the years has has resonated so much with other people. It's it, you know, it's a way for me to get closer to them and and them for to get closer to me. And and uh, you know, it, it's something we need more of in this world wow terrific i mean that terrific uh, ladies and gentlemen feel free to visit his website at pauldwarren.com let me spell that for you it's p-a-u-l-d-o-i-r-o-n pronounced dwarren.com you must be greek huh <laughs> I am French. <laughs> oh, I'm shocked. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paul. What a delight. Thank, Thank you, you my dear friend. And uh, we'll, we'll be hearing from you again, I'm sure. Okay? Okay. Thank you, Paul. No time to blow Excuse me, mister, if you please I gotta go Born one morning on the day of the dead In a bombed out bungalow My mama kissed my cheek and said I gotta go I gotta go somewhere I gotta go 